I first heard about this project when Glenn McClure came to Paul Smith's college where I teach the natural sciences. And it was a really interesting evening. He came to the auditorium, uh, was full of students and faculty, and he had a pile of traditional American instruments, a banjo and other things like that. And uh, that's what really originally drew me, that he was playing this great music that my wife and I like to play too, and some of the students. But then he brought up this idea of a folk opera, which just sounded fantastic, something that would involve the whole community um, and be a really high level thing that also helped us realize who we are and where we live and how those two things go together so well. So in keeping with this spirit of community involvement, um, Glenn invited me to be participating, not as a musician, which I might have first thought I would do, but actually as a scientist. Um, and as it turns out, um, the research I've been doing with the students at Paul Smith's College has to do with the history of local lakes, climate change, pollution stories, recovering from acid rain, and things like that. And we do that by reading the stories of the lakes in the layers of sediment that accumulate under the lakes. Like sort of uh, every year when the, the plants are growing around the lake, their pollen falls in the water and sinks to the bottom. You can see the algae and the plankton that were living in the lake, and they die and they sink to the bottom. So layer after layer are like pages in a book telling the story of the lake. So we collect those sediments with uh, sediment corers, which I could show you in a minute if you like. And uh, we look back through the layers decades, centuries, even thousands of years back in time and try to sort of speak for the lake and what its story is, what's been happening to it, what's normal, what's new, and things like that. So the most amazing thing with Glenn that really got me excited was that I could hand him my nerdy scientific graph, which interprets the story of the lake in terms of numbers, that he could convert into a musical score, into a beautiful melody that in a way sort of made the lake sing as well as give its raw data. So I've got here the, the sampler that we used. It's basically a clear tube that you lower down into the sediment under its own weight. Here's the weight, here's the tube. Imagine the layers stacked like pages in a book with the youngest ones on top and the oldest ones down below. And we're in a boat or sometimes on the ice in winter, you drill a hole and you lower this down on a rope and it sinks into the sediment under its own weight. So if that's the sediment layers, you're going down into it. And this tube now is full of stacked mud layers. The present day, last year's plankton and pollen and seeds and things from the forest are all up here. And these down here at the bottom could be hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So you can see sometimes environmental changes. And in fact, we do at uh, this one lake called Wolf Lake in the middle of the Adirondacks, very remote. But even out there in the, the wilds of Wolf Lake, you can see a, a recent change in the last century where human impacts have altered it slightly. So the basic story that comes out of these layers as we sample them down is uh, we have become part of the ecosystem here, changing even the most remote lakes. And so with the data that came out of this, we drew it as a graph. And we looked at the plankton fossils that were in here. And basically, the amount of impact increased through time and rose higher and higher on the graph. When Glenn took that, he made the notes get higher and higher in the melody to represent the changes of our connection to the lake and affecting even this remote wilderness. So in one sense, it could sound like a negative story, that we're altering what had been an untouched ecosystem. But to me, it's relatively mild changes, and it actually shows me that we're part of the landscape now enough to have our story recorded along with the lake as well. Well, as a musician, I'm used to trying to get emotional responses from people when I do something. But as a scientist, you sort of try to avoid that. And so for me, it was actually a surprise when I attended the first performance that included the procession of the pines in it. Uh, it was two years ago now, as of now. Um, I was listening for it, and I hear the beautiful voice singing over this rising melody. And I recognized what that rising melody was. And it brought tears to my eyes. In fact, I'm choking up a little bit now. Just to think of that, I really felt like we had given a voice to a, 
to the land and to the lakes, that it could have a way to tell a story in a way that we could listen to and tell about our connection to the place where we live. So I felt like, <clears throat> I felt like it really helped me feel more closely anchored to the land and to the lakes that I now realize how much I love as well because of, of an outlet like that. There are a lot of important messages in this folk opera. One of them, uh, from the purely scientific view, which is my small role in this, is that even the most pristine looking wild areas of places like the Adirondacks are changing now because of the human presence on the planet. Um, things from acid rain and other pollutants coming in on the air to the air itself that's getting warmer from our fossil fuel emissions and changing the ecology of the lakes. So to present that not just verbally or with numbers but with music at an emotional level I think is really important. And for my fellow scientists I think it's important too to realize that we have other ways of communicating what we find with the public at large that may not be interested in graphs but might respond on other emotional levels as well. So I think that's very exciting. There are other things that happened too that were unexpected as well for me. Um, being drawn into the project for that science aspect of it and turning the science into music, of course, then brought me into the whole story of the folk opera. And um, I've lived here for 30-ish years. And uh, I felt like I was connected to this place and felt like it was a home. but this has brought me to a deeper level to realize that me, other people who live here, people I know, now that we've been digging into the story of John Brown, abolition, uh, Timbuktu, Lyman Epps, all of these amazing people, and then of course the native folks who were before that too, realize there are much deeper human stories here than we had been paying attention to. And also, I've become really proud of the fact that John Brown was so active here in the Underground Railroad was so active here. I'd, I'd sort of heard that story peripherally, but this really brought it home to me. We were a really central part of the story of ending slavery and uh, developing a, a deeper sense of common humanity. Um, so that's something I want to try to build into what the remaining life I've got to try to be more aware of that and continue in that spirit.